Welcome to a new chapter in information technology. This time it's about trends in IT. I will not discuss each and every trend. I will just focus on how to identify trends and I will focus on one which is artificial intelligence or machine learning respectively. So why is this important? As you might remember, we talked about the challenges we face within digital transformation. And one challenge, one class of challenges lies within technology. And here, one of it is to define a well-suited enabler. So to know what are the current trends in IT, to have an idea what comes next or what does fit to your own purpose, to your own needs within your company or privately. So to understand what's going on is important if you would like to continuously develop yourself and your company and the society. So question is, what are current trends in IT? What new information technologies are there? which maybe a little bit older technologies are just maturing and are now ready for the market. And which of those are relevant for companies? There's different ways to answer these questions. So where can I find these technologies? One is for example to go on fairs or to congresses. Another one would be to read newspapers which are focusing on these issues. And one is to maybe have a look on the Gartner hype cycle. Gartner is a consulting company and it publishes this Gartner hype cycle since 1995. In the past it has been um, only for, for new emerging technologies Nowadays, it is so successful, this hype cycle, and some areas have become so broad that special hype cycles, for example, for AI, have been um, developed. So, this is how it looks like. Once again, the Gartner hype cycle describes technological trends on their way from novelty to everyday use. It has been first published in 1995 and it has been quite successful since then. The important thing is this curve. You can see this red curve. So it's not a straight line starting from the lower left up to the upper right corner. It's some kind of curve which goes up and down and up again. On the x-axis we face a time. It's not let's say a time in years, it's more a relative time. And on the y-axis, you see the visibility of a certain technology. Usually it starts in the um, lower left corner and it goes up to what it's called a peak of inflated expectations. That's when the technology is presented at fairs, it's presented at YouTube as the new um, thing which everybody has to use and, and look for. However, Usually these expectations are, just as it's said, inflated. So once each and everybody is going to, to the product, you fall down and you go in this trough of disillusionment. So you see, it's not that easy to adapt the technology, it doesn't fit to your needs, it's maybe not running stable and so on and so on. But some of these technologies continue and they slowly go up again in what it's called a slope of enlightenment and finally reach the plateau of product productivity. Then at this plateau it's no longer exciting to talk about these products. So the visibility is not so much um, there anymore. However, however, everybody uses these products. For example, take navigational systems. When they popped up these navigational systems in the 90s, they really were um, 
expensive, they were discussed all around, they were shown, um, let's say, in the very newest cars, and so on and so on. But then people found out, hey, it's, uh, the, the, the maps inside are not well enough, they found out it's really expensive, they saw that the, uh, the technology is sometimes going wrong, so that is what it's called, this disillusionment. However, however over time they got better and better, the algorithms increased, the maps have been uh, thoroughly developed and uh, the technology has become cheaper. Nowadays each car has a navigational system. However, it's no longer exciting, it's just everyday technology. So this kind of, of uh, curve is what the Gartner hype cycle is all about. However, now new things are, the new technologies are shown in terms where can they be located in this, um, in this cycle. What you can see here is the Gartner hype cycle for 2021. So there is quite some techniques which are starting from the innovation trigger and go up to um, the peak of inflated expectations. The technologies do have different kind of patterns. So the light blue means they are um, it takes two to five years until they reach the plateau of productivity. Whereas the re red triangle means it will take more than 10 years. Interesting for us are those which I have marked in yellow. These are all AI related. AI means artificial intelligence. So you can see AI augmented software engineering, generative AI, physics informed AI and so on. There's one called quantum ML. ML stands for machine learning and is a sub part of artificial intelligence. And as you can see, um, there are quite some of these technologies connected to AI and that's why I have chosen to have a little bit deeper look into AI in the following pages. Artificial intelligence. Is it a challenge for today? Actually, it is. It is not just discussed in technical, in IT journals. I have looked into the Zeit, Die Zeit, which is a weekly journal politics and, and business in Germany and uh, I have found more than 2,000 search results when looking for artificial intelligence. And it covers all kind of areas. Politics when it comes to new laws ruling AI in the EU. It comes to climate when it goes to the question if AI and digitalization are climate helpers or climate sinners. It discuss effects of AI on the labor market, is AI opportunity or it's job killer? And it discuss certain areas like medicine where artificially, artificial intelligence helps to discover and make progress in medicines. So the first question of all is, what is after all intelligence? And what is artificial intelligence? You could stop the video in here and first think about your own definition of intelligence. So, what is intelligence? What are signs for an intelligence behavior? So if you don't know, the first thing is to go to Wikipedia. And here you find a definition which goes back to psychology and intelligence is something to understand um, between and read and th things like that. It somehow defines, a, it, it's a collective term which defines person's cognitive ability. Now again, what is cognitive ability? There are different cognitive abilities and which can be found to different de uh, degrees. Hmm. 
So what is intelligence? If you don't know, you of course go first to Wikipedia and have a look there. You can find some definition which comes from psychology, which goes back and defines psychology as person's cognitive abilities. How again does this help? What are now cognitive abilities? In the end, it turns out that there is no universally valid definition of intelligence. However, there are various theories how intelligence can be defined and how can it be operationalized. Let's have a look on one theory. Already in 1938, Louis Thurstone defined seven primary abilities which are still asked in intelligence tests today. These are verbal comprehension, word fluency, deductive reasoning, special imagination, retentiveness, num numeracy and perceptual speed. And again, each of these um, skills could be, let's say, questioned uh, how it is really defined and so on and so on. And there is one real criticism. Intelligence is what you can test with intelligent tests. So often it's more the way we operationalize a test for a certain ability rather than a real good definition of what intelligence is really all about. Having a look at these seven primary abilities, in which of those do you think computers perform well? And which are those where they lead to bad results? Let's come to the next question. What is now artificial intelligence? So yes, we do not have a correct or a precise understanding of what intelligence is all about. But artificial intelligence is simply the idea of a machine which is intelligent. Maybe of a computer which is intelligent. The idea of AI is based on the idea of a man or a woman as a machine. So we are all in the way robots composed of Mil billions of cells and if we could build something like that well, then we are uh, have a, have a an, an, and if we can build something like that then we have artificial intelligence anyhow the idea of a man as a machine is discussed quite contro controversial some people argue men and women are much more than a machine we have two different approaches in AI. The first one is called strong artificial intelligence. This can be described as to create an intelligence that can think and solve problems like humans and that is characterized by a form of consciousness. One of the uh, protagonists here argues one of the goals is to overcome the death of man. If you can build a machine, if you can build a computer which has a form of consciousness, you can, for example, copy your consciousness, your brains, your thoughts into that machine and by that you um, overcome death. Another one has called the idea to build a computer that is proud of me. And now proud is some very emotional thing which is hard to, to define or to assign to a computer nowadays. So the idea is really to have something which has a consciousness and has emotions. And yes, it is debatable whether strong AI is even possible. What do you think? Do you think a computer can have some kind of consciousness? Or is this really limited to men or to maybe animals? Beside strong AI, there is what it is called weak AI. 
It simply means we imitate intelligent behavior without claiming consciousness or the like. And weak AI is already used in every day. So for example, if you would say navigation and uh, special thinking is something uh, which is intelligent behavior, then a navigational system in your car imitates intelligent behavior and maybe it is here even better than some people. The basic problem, if you would like to go for AI, is how actually do humans think? And here we have two approaches. The first is symbolic AI and the other one is sub-symbolic AI. Sub symbolic, sorry, symbolic AI approaches a problem from above and considers logical reasoning as a basis and symbols are used for this purpose. For example, think about languages. You can have this top-down approach by thinking of concepts like words, which are part of each and every language, and rules, which form the grammar for each and uh, every language. And you try simply to define a language by defining the words and the rules. However, you know that small kids do not have an understanding of words and grammars and rules, but they can talk anyhow. What uh, small kids simply do, they do not learn these rules, they simply imitate other people and by that they learn talking. When kids learn languages, something happens in their brain. Neurons are structured, they are connected to each other and these structures become more fixed over and over again by learning. And these connections are the basic principle here. That's why sometimes sub-symbolic AI is also called connectionism. And this type of behavior, learning, learning, learning and forming structures, that's what's used in sub-symbolic technically AI as well. People try to build up models which are trained by input data these structure, they are, they are learning these type of uh, computers and by that they build up structures which later on enables them to imitate something, to imitate language, to see pictures and derive conclusions from it, what is shown on these pictures, etc. Mathematics and chess were the first benchmarks in AI. What do you think? Which was first tried, symbolic or sub-symbolic AI? Of course it's symbolic, because both are well designed to use symbolic AI. Take chess for example. Chess has some concepts like the figures, like the moves they can do, like this chessboard with its 64 fields. And you can define rules on how and strategies and tactics on a very symbolic way. A typ typical representative of symbolic AI is a so-called expert system. The basic idea is the imitation of the decision-making process of a human expert. For example, you have facts in a database and processing rules. Example here could be we have statements like all trees are made of wood, wood is flammable, x is a tree, and then we can derive from these facts and rules x is flammable. Special programming languages like Lisp or Prolog have been developed to define these kind of rules and concepts. And there are some kind of applications, for example, in medicine. So if you would like, for example, to find out what kind of illness a certain patient has, then you can look for symptoms. And these symptoms and their relation to certain um, infects is then what is represented in these kind of processing rules. The quality of decisions in some areas is comparable to, numer to a human expert. 
A very big advantage of this approach is you can justify a decision. So when, for example, a medicine expert system argues, hey, you have a flu, then you can ask, why do you think I have a flu? And the expert system can then argue, okay, you have symptom 1, A, B, C, D, E, and these are all a good justification for the argument that you have a flu. Disadvantage in here is that there are lots of problems with uncertain knowledge, problems with exceptions. And sometimes the acquisition of knowledge is difficult because experts do have the knowledge, but they are not really able to express their knowledge. A simple example of an expert system is this Akinator. Just follow the link. It's basically a game where you think of a famous person and then questions are asked and finally, typically these, uh, these AI finds out and gives a, gives a um, proposal and the, most often this proposal is correct. But you can very easily see what are the concepts, this database and what are the process, processing rules which are asked for. So, although some initial results have been achieved, especially until the 90s, with symbolic AI, there seems to be a limit that cannot be crossed. For example, speech recognition. Most elder uh, translation systems are based on the idea that there is a universal language which is based on a vocabulary, on words and on rules, and we simply have to yeah, let's say, define the, uh, the rules for, for a language, then we can map one language to another language. However, translation is not going that way. Image recognition is another example where a certain threshold could not be crossed. So, let's have a look on other approaches. The other approach, the approach with sub-symbolic AI is, for example, done with machine learning. Machine learning means you do not prescribe any rules. Instead, you have training data which is fed into special algorithms and these algorithms then derive regularities and patterns by themselves. Easy example. We have collected data from hundreds of iris flowers. So we have the width and the length of the petals, we have the width and the length of the sepals and we have defined the species. Actually there are three different species in total. And now you try to train an artificial intelligence on the basis of the collected data so that it only predicts the species by specifying the width and the length of the leaves. Let's have a closer look on this example. Here you can see these five attributes again. In each of these rows in the table, you do have a value for sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width, and finally the species. There is three types of species, Iris setosa, Iris virginica and Isis versicolora. Now the question is, if we leave away the fifth column, the species, are we able to derive from the four values at the very in the first four columns, are we able to derive the species from those data? So what can we do? If we have, for example, 150 iris flowers data sets, then we use 100 of them to learn the system. And we take the other 50 to later on test if our learning was successful. That's basically how these approaches work. In the following example, I have simplified the model. I have only two dimensions, namely the length and the width of the sepal. And each of these points is one data set and depending on the color, you have one of the three species. And what you can see already, the red ones are a little bit aside, so you can good, 
easily find out if it is one of those. However, the orange and the yellow ones, they are somehow overlapping. So if you have now one cross in here, what type of species would it be? Yeah, you could now guess and say, it's either this or that. To make it more precise, that's what a support vector machine, a simple machine learning algorithm is doing. It basically defines areas in, these, uh, in this two-dimensional space. And these areas are separated by strict lines. So it's easy to show what is happening if you have just two dimensions. But if you have a four-dimensional space, it's actually subdivided accordingly with what it's called three-dimensional hyperplanes. So in two-dimensional um, shapes, we have simply separations by one-dimensional lines. And in four dimensions, we have a subdivision by three-dimensional hyperplanes. Actually, in our mind, we can't really imagine this. However, it's relatively easy to do a calculation. Different areas arise, and these can be used for classification. So again, yeah, if I'm now in this um, dark blue area, this cross is in this dark blue area, I can simply argue because it's there, it's probably belonging to this red species. Let's go to a real world example. Let's go to what it's called a churn analysis. And actually, this data is used in churn analysis in big companies. For example, you have a telecommunication company and they have millions of contracts. And one special question they always have is, which of those contractors, which of our customers uh, has a high probability to leave? And a churn analysis tries to answer exactly this question. So what you can do is you can take from each customer certain data. And again, in this table, each row um, represents one uh, customer. And each column represents one attribute. So for example, the state where the person is living, the account length, the area code, the phone number, um, voice, mail plan, and so on and so on and so on. And in the last column, the churn, you see, based on historical data, if there has been a churn, meaning somebody left the contract, or if there has been no churn. And now the idea is simply based on these, uh, based on these figures to find out those candidates which have a, a high probability to leave. Then you can contact this person, make them special offers, and so on and so on. So again, which customer in this um, field is most likely to leave? Yeah, you will come up with a 20-dimensional um, data set, 21-dimensional dim data set. 20 dimensions are used for learning. And the last one is then the churn, which is uh, shall be deducted from it. Neural networks take an even more different approach. So what actually is a neuron and how does it work? In biology, a neuron is a nerve cell. In your brain, you have billions of neurons and they are connected to each other by synapses. And many interconnected neurons form a neural network. Simplified, Neurons have two states, on and off. And the state depends on the inputs from other neurons. This model actually is very compatible with IT. So you could build up an artificial network of neurons. Why is it compatible? Because on and off corresponds to a digital logic and linking of neurons corresponds to this input processing output principle. And already 19, in the 1940s, when computer have not really been developed, it was shown that neurons can be used 
to reproduce two valued logics with and and or and not. Again, let's have a look on these artificial net neural networks. Let's start with the biology on the upper left side. What you can see is a picture of a neuron. So you see this nucleus, which is either in the state on or off. You see it impulses carried toward the cell body from the outside. And then you see an axon where impulses are carried away from the cell body and which are connected to other cells and give input there. On the upper right corner you can see a mathematical model for that. You have this cell body function, a sum, over weighted inputs. The inputs are these x0, x1, x2 and each of those, each of those inputs is multiplied with weight 0, weight 1, weight 2. And then you have a threshold, so if this um, sum comes over a certain defined value, then the cell body switches to on, otherwise it's off. And then this on or off is transported as an input to a following neuron. And in the lower picture, you simply see a artificial neuron network. So what you see, you have on the left side these green neurons, they form input signals. Uh, somehow it could be, for example, the value of pixels. Then you have maybe thousands input signals, each corresponds to one, um, to one pixel. Then you have a network of neurons. Each of these neurons is connected to each of these input signals. Each of these neurons contains some kind of uh, cell body, some kind of mathematical function, with each of them having different uh, values for weights, 0 to weights n or weight 1000. And the output is then forwarded to the output signal, which again um, consists of this weighted function. And the following properties apply to both natural and artificial neural networks. Neural networks can learn. Learning here means you give the net a set of input data and classify this data. This is what has been, is basically the same what we have done with the irises or with the churn analysis. And then the network calibrates the weights W, which you can see on the uh, previous page, so that it can finally classify unknown input data by itself. Example, a neural network is trained on cat pictures. So you hand in a picture, picture, picture and picture. Each of these pixels of the picture is one input neuron. You give the net a series of pictures and cats, of, of cats and of non-cats, so you have somehow a value of here it's, um, it's a cat and here it's not a cat. And finally, when these values for these Ws, these values for the weights are adapted, the model might be able to identify cats and dogs from each other. The correct training of, um, is of course important, the correct training data. Of course, real neural networks nowadays are a little bit more complex. We talk about deep learning, which means we have several layers internally. So we do not have only one hidden layer as shown in the, in the first diagram, but we have several layers um, of, uh, of, of neurons. And we're not talking about now 10 or a handful of neurons, we're talking about hundreds or thousands or millions of neurons inside such kind of uh, deep learning network. And then we're going to feed the network with pictures of cats and with pictures of non-cats, for example, dogs. And then finally, we say, okay, here's a picture and now you decide based on your values for these weights W, you decide if this picture contains a cat or a dog or something else. That's 
how neural networks work. And actually, these neural networks are quite successful. For example, they are able to identify traffic signs. So that's what self-driving cars are doing. Out of 50,000 traffic signs, which were dirty or poorly illuminated, 99.46% were recognized, which means we have an error rate of 0.45%. And a human comparison group had a um, higher error rate. Google Maps uses pattern recognition in for house numbers. So when they would like to have Google Maps data, it is necessary to recognize a house number. Um, and to do this automatically, you have to first define, find on a picture where is the number. And in a second step, you have to identify which number it actually is. We have nowadays um, pattern recognition, for example, for faces or facial expressions. In China, the face idea is used in ATM to decide if the correct owner of account is asking for money. In today's medicine, um, it's used as well. Tissue images are sent in. Uh, for example, deep learning is currently used to analyze X-ray or MRT images. Experts assume that nowadays of current images only 10% of the information is used by humans. But it's quite easy to feed these kind of pictures to, to, to uh, artificial intelligence. You can simply take 1 million X-ray pictures of for example um, a, a breast and then argue okay for, for 500,000 people, we haven't identified cancer in the long run. And for another 500,000, we have identified cancer later on. And now the, uh, the prediction by AI suddenly becomes better than those of the humans. Neural networks cannot only recognize pictures, they can do much more. Neural networks can also play chess, or even more difficult to play Go. And again, the strategy has changed here. In the past, when we had this symbolic AI, we tried to feed the rules of the game chess into the computer. Nowadays, you simply feed the computer with chess moves of games, and in the end you argue, here white has won and here has black won. And by that, the chess computer identifies by itself what are the rules of chess. It identifies strategies and so on and so on. And today, best chess computers are all built up in this way. And even more difficult it is to play this Asian game Go. And there is an interesting AlphaGo movie on YouTube. Simply search for it which shows in, an, in a 90 minute video how this um, Go machine was trained and how in the end it bet the uh, world champion in Korea. This was really a shock to the Asian world. Neural networks have not only won in chess and Go, but as well in Jeopardy. And here the question is not to, to get this knowledge, the problem is more to understand the natural language. It can translate. I think the best translation engine right now is on deeple.com. Give it a try. And again, it's not based on defining language rules. It simply takes text, 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 for example, in German and English, and try to find, okay, how has translation been done, and try to adapt this to, let's say, your input. Neural networks can compose. Bach is one of those composers which has often been used as uh, giving an input. So you give hundreds or thousands of pieces of music of Bach to a computer and ask the computer, now compose something similar. So the result you can find under YouTube, under the link. And even experts are not able to decide if it is a real Bach or if it is a fake Bach. 
They can do lots more things. And maybe the last one I would like to point on is ChatGPT. It has been published in November 2022, so it's just a, a month old. You can go to this web page, openai.com, and look for ChatGPT. And you can ask in uh, natural language basically each question and you will get an answer. So some of uh, my colleagues, and you can see this in YouTube, have checked how good will they be able to answer exam questions. So maybe you should have a look and uh, find out how ChatGPT works. However, there are problems with machine learning and neural networks. The one thing is you have to get the right quality of the training data. So there is a lot of biased training data. If, for example, your data is somehow um, full of racism, then the result will be full of racism as well. The results are sometimes not comprehensible. Example, the AI rejects a credit application. However, the user cannot see what was the decision based on. Why do I get a rejection? And the AI is not able to argue, you do not get it because you um, have a too big car or something like that. And this causes results uh, problems with the GDPR. Because here you have the right to get um, algorithmic decisions reviewed. And last but not least, AI has become so powerful that results are not questioned anymore. Again, you can go to this chat GBT I've shown on the last slide. And what you will see that sometimes, for example, Wikipedia articles are created by AI, which are 90% correct. But because these 90% um, are so, look so good, the other 10%, which are not correct, are believed in as well. So yes, AI is a very strong tool, but it has some kind of problems inherited.